So you ready to have some fun? Learn about AR and VR? I'm, I'm very excited to introduce all our speakers today. Our first speaker uh, here in Bindi uh, got his master's in computer science uh, here. So uh, shout out to the Watson School. Well done. And he leads Qualcomm's uh, VR and AR programs. Um, multifunctional teams across three different continents. Uh, he's really been uh, a shining example of uh, what, what Binghamton students can do when they get out there. He's been a critical member of the company's Android team, collaborating with Google to launch the first Android and Nexus devices. He's helped commercialize hundreds of unique Android devices in China, India, and Southeast Asia. And he's developed on-device video playback and streaming tools. And in the conversation I was uh, fortunate to have with him last night, he's an enthusiastic sponsor and, and, and uh, developer of VR and AR technologies. So, Hiran, come on up, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. I want to talk about my journey so far. We have, it's alum day, uh, we have a lot of alumni here today. I am just not an alumni. And I want to state this because we are here in 2017, uh, September, uh, October, and it's very important for me to say that I was just not an alum, I'm just not an alumni. I am a classic example of a Binghamton, an international alumni. I came here 15 years ago from India, and the first place where I foot, uh, placed my footsteps out on the US soil was at Binghamton Airport. I flew. Bombay, London, London, Chicago, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Bomb uh, Binghamton. <laughs> and, you know, the journey to Binghamton was, uh, it was just about 30 hours. Uh, and I know that it hasn't changed a lot because uh, now I do travel to Asia pretty often for work. And I was talking to somebody else yesterday that in about 14 hours uh, from home, I'm able to reach uh, China or Taiwan, but it took me about eight and a half hours uh, yesterday to reach Binghamton. Uh, so, but... Uh, the thing is, when I came here, Binghamton for me was what the U.S. represented for the first two years of my life. And the beauty of it was, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this Friendship Family Program. So there's a Friendship Family Program where uh, students are welcomed by a Friendship Family. And there was a, I, I, I signed literally the last day. Uh, it was the day before the, our uh, inauguration or the orientation, and I signed the last day, and I was appointed this family called as Ashers. And it was amazing. They, uh, I was introduced to the American culture. And during our conversations, we realized that the values of the United States and India were just about the same. We all loved peace. We just loved family values. And I was very well welcomed here. So that helped build my foundation. I was 21 years, 22 years old back then that helped build the foundation of me as a human being. And then my two years here in Watson School helped build my foundations as a technology guy, as an engineer. And me working day and night at places like Hinman and Newman Dining Services for, at Sodexo helped build a lot of other values as well. Uh, the point being, this is home for me now. It's been 16 years. But I owe a lot of gratitude to Binghamton University to making me who I am. And I must say, I have a gratitude to this place, and I thank you all, because even when I come here today, I've been speaking to a lot of international students over the past 48 hours. It's just amazing that this place hasn't changed, and thank you very much for that. My journey began from Binghamton. I went to San Diego for, um, to meet a friend of mine, and it was April of 2003. I was wearing a heavy jacket. It was 15 inches of snow here. I walk out of San Diego airport, and I come out, and I'm wearing a heavy jacket, and my friend comes to pick me up, and he's in a, uh, uh, an Abercrombie T-shirt and shorts and a car with uh, the windows down. And I'd never, I'd never been in a car with the windows rolled down in Binghamton. <laughs> and I, and and I see, I see palm trees, and I see uh, the breeze, and I could go to the beach, and I said, I have to find a job here. And so while all my friends were looking out for jobs in Seattle at Microsoft or uh, Bloomberg uh, in NYC, which uh, hires a lot out of Binghamton, my, my aim in life at that point was to find something in, uh, in San Diego. And fortunately, I was blessed to uh, 
get a job at Qualcomm. I started as an intern. Uh, I developed engineering tools for the first four years, and then I realized that I was good at my job, but I wanted to do something else. I wanted to communicate with people. I wanted to interact with people. I wanted to go out and work on projects and take a step back and think about products. And so I took a step back. I, uh, I, was, I was asked to work on this, this project where some search engine company in the Bay Area was working on this new operating system called Android, and it was going to be hopefully something. So I started working on that. And, um, I helped launch the first Google Android device and the first Nexus device. And I did product management for about five years. And then I decided to pursue my MBA uh, up at Berkeley. And I graduated two years ago, uh, about three years ago, and then had this opportunity to start leading augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, AR and VR has been a pretty core component of my career life over the past two years. And that's been my journey from the career perspective. One of the other things that I have a lot of gratitude towards Binghamton for is I met my wife here. And uh, out of all places, uh, meeting an Indian girl from the same city where I was, right here in Binghamton, was, uh, was destiny. Uh, today we have uh, two beautiful kids, uh, a six-year-old daughter and a two-year-old boy. And they're beautiful because they take it from their mom, thankfully. <laughs> so. Uh, here I am, as I said, uh, an international alumni who came here 15 years ago. Uh, this is home for me. And I'm, I want to thank uh, Binghamton University, the president, uh, James, Peter, uh, Bill, Courtney, and everybody else who's here who's helped make this day happen. So thank you very much. And now let's start with tears. So I hope I am able to inspire, educate, and resonate the values of uh, the technology aspect as well as what AR, VR is. So, a show of hands, how many of you actually are aware of what augmented reality and virtual reality is? Wow, I think we can just, okay, all right. <laughs> so, okay, uh, let's start with the fundamentals first. Uh, virtual reality is where it creates physical presence in the virtual world. Most of the devices out here today look something like these. You wear the devices and you are occluded from the external world. So if you're wearing a device like this, and if you find yourself in the uh, middle of Manhattan, uh, finding yourself seeing the uh, Times Square building, and then seeing the Disney store on your left, and the Hard Rock Cafe on the, on the right, and you're wearing your glasses, you're sitting right here in Binghamton, in your living room, you're wearing the headset, and you have your headphones on, and you're able to see the Times Square building, you look on the left, you look on the right, and you're able to get a virtual world experience where you're sitting right there. So you have nothing to do with reality at that point, except that you are in reality, but you're watching or you're having a true immersive experience. That's virtual reality. Augmented reality is where you have glasses like these, and you are, when you wear these glasses, I could still see the real world, but then I do have virtual objects. So how many of you are aware of Pokemon? <laughs> I guess so. So when you wear glasses, if let's say if you're wearing glasses and uh, you find a virtual dinosaur or uh, having a telepresence of somebody sitting here right here on the chair, except that those people aren't there, but the key difference in augmented reality is that you're augmenting virtual objects in the real world while you're also able to see the world. Are you guys with me? There is gonna be a quiz at the end of this. He hasn't told you guys, so please make sure you're with me here. Virtual world glasses, you wear it, you don't see the real world. Augmented uh, reality, you're wearing glasses, you're able to see the real world. Now, there's a lot of terms. Um, so first, VR, what is, how is VR gonna help? There's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be able to help you play, learn, communicate, play. I mean, you're gonna wear glasses, you'd be having, games where uh, you could actually not only like the video games that are there today or any sort of interactive uh, engagements that you have is where you have on a frame of a 14 inch laptop or a 13 inch laptop or your smartphone. Now you're wearing glasses and you just, you cannot just see this frame, but you could see up, left, right uh, at the back. Now imagine that instead of using keys, you're wearing headset and um, let's say it's a game of uh, where you're a cop. So instead of just navigating through the keyboards, you could actually walk in the game and find yourself and actually be a part of the experience. 
So instead of just having a connected experience, you have now an immersive experience. Learning, immersive education, you could wear glasses and you could understand more about any field that you want. We'll get into some of these examples. Communicate, social interactions. Imagine, um, I'm in, I live in San Diego, some of you are in Binghamton. If you want to have a virtual chat, we wear our individual glasses and meet in a virtual world. Uh, so instead of just having text messaging on a Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, you're actually meeting in a virtual world and interacting with each other. AR will serve a bot a spectrum of roles in daily lives where um, you're wearing glasses, you could, you could, as I gave an example of people playing, let's say um, this is a university, this would be a splendid example where I am, let's say I'm a geography teacher uh, or I'm, I'm just a teacher who wants to teach my students about the solar system and all my students are wearing glasses and instead of showing them a book or a picture I say, all right students, look at the solar system and the solar system comes up here in the air and instead of showing them pictures of the sun and the earth, I say, all right, let's walk to the Saturn. Let's walk to the planet Saturn. Let's see how the rings look up close. Let's see why they're different. I read something, I'll remember 50%. I write something, I'll remember about 70%. I do something and I will never forget. These kind of experiences are going to be de delivered through AR glasses. Now, Across the planet, because AR, VR is new and niche, different companies are using different terminologies. There's VR and AR, there's mixed reality, there's merged reality, there's, uh, and we have, at, I work at Qualcomm, so we are uh, aligning ourselves to one of these industry forum uh, terminologies called as XR, which is extended reality. So this is reality, we are all seeing here uh, each other, there's no virtual objects, Anybody seeing any virtual objects right now? <laughs> I just want to make sure. So, so this is the real world. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is virtual reality, where you're wearing glasses. You're not seeing anybody in the real world, but there's virtual objects. So think of these two as two ends of the spectrum. Everything that comes between these, it's all encompassed under this umbrella of XR or extended reality. XR is the next mobile compute platform, and it's going to take care of all these different uh, fields, and we'll get into some of these, industrial, manufacturing, healthcare, education, under the XR paradigm over the next decade and a half. Why do we think that XR is the next mobile compute platform? Imagine how things have changed over the past three and a half to four decades. Um, how many young people are here in the audience who had interacted with mainframes? Pretty young people. So mainframes were something for, and, uh, for people who are like 17 or 20 years old, in case you don't know what mainframes are, these used to be like big computers that used to occupy rooms and used to do some basic computes that used to happen in about hours, but now it takes a few seconds to have the same amount of compute. Now those mainframes, from mainframes we moved to PCs. You are all aware of what PCs are. And from PCs we moved to smartphones. And from smartphones, if you see the devices are becoming smaller, the compute is becoming more complex, and now the compute is going to go where it's always been. How do we interact with this compute? We look at stuff. We interact with it through our eyes. And it's all going to go from, it's gone from mainframe to PCs. There is a, the first wave, second wave, the third wave has been the smartphones. And now from here, it's going right in front of your eyes, which would be what is also popularly known as spatial computing. And that's what AR VR is all about. It's gone through these phases, and everything that we've learned on smartphone is going to be leveraged for XR. Will smartphone become an XR kind of a wearable device or uh, glasses? That's something that we strongly feel we are, and I know that some of my colleagues here uh, as speakers are also going to cover a lot more about this today. Again, young people in the audience. How many people use the first few phones that came out, the mobile phones which were like this big and had buttons that looked like these in the late 1980s? Yes, sir. Can we have a big round of applause for this young gentleman right here? <laughs> so we, we have, we've used devices like these and we've come to devices like this here today. And we've seen the uh, phones go from 
through a different technology revolution that we've seen over the past 15 years. And we are confident that XR is also going to go through the same phase. XR is here today because the devices that you see today uh, are still in the process of becoming sleeker. And that's just not something that I feel because I'm working on this technology. Uh, this has been shared by some of these other gentlemen who lead the industries and big companies. Mark Zuckerberg, we can't build the AR product that we want today, so building VR is the path to getting to those AR glasses. Tim Cook, Apple CEO, I regard AR as a big idea. Like the smartphone, I think AR is that big, it's huge. Tom Hodges, who's the CEO of Deutsche Telekom, AR is exciting, such devices could eventually replace smartphones. So it's gonna follow a similar 10 to 20 year cycle. It's gonna be uh, with, going to go towards sleeker designs, more powerful experiences as we move forward. The types of devices that are there today, today there's uh, a tethered HMD device where you wear a device and it's connected to a PC. And that's the device which are popularly like the HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, that's one category of devices. There's these other two category of devices which are smartphone XR where you could wear a, just a viewer and insert the uh, smartphone in there or use your phone for AR experiences. Apple recently announced something called as AR Kit. Google recently announced something called as AR Core. They are the smartphone experiences. And standalone devices, the device like this right here, does not require you to be connected to any cables. You could use it in any room. It's a truly mobile device. My work has been purely on the right two sides uh, because uh, the future of XR is within uh, Qualcomm's DNA, which is mobile and wireless. It is going to revolutionize industries and enterprises as I just shared with you. Um, I gave you an example of education and how students could interact with the solar system. Let me give you another example, which is uh, something that has been in my uh, thoughts, especially over the last uh, eight to 10 days since the uh, horrific event in Vegas. Imagine the first responders glasses that they're wearing today they're wearing glasses to save themselves from any sort of heat. Now, imagine wearing glasses like these a few years from now, which would have 4G, 5G connectivity, which would have a rare camera, which would have an optoelectronic night vision, which would have eye tracking cameras, recording cameras, and all in glasses, just like some of you are wearing right now. The glasses like these today can provide the similar sort of functionality, but imagine the designs to be much sleeker and having all these different functionalities. But what's the use of that? How, how, how would it be used? So let me give you a peek into through these eyes now. Let's say I'm a uh, first responder and there's fire at a floor in a hotel and I go to the hotel and I, as I'm walking through this hallway, I realize somebody's calling for help I know what's the temperature here because there's fire in this room. It's 450 second, 457 Fahrenheit. At the same time, in the right side here, I know that in the, through a rare camera, one of my other colleagues is already helping someone who's uh, been saved. I also have a building map floor that shows me what's happening on different floors. Can you imagine the possibilities of what could be done here? And again, although we're wearing glasses, if most of you have experienced AR or VR, it's not, although the glasses are right near your eyes, the experience of seeing these are as if they are at a distance of about six feet or nine feet or three feet based on the application. Imagine having these, this sort of uh, help all the time for just somebody on the first transponder side. Now, that's just one example of how this could be done. These technologies and use cases will evolve from mobile. Let me just take a quick break here. So, so far, we've seen what AR and what VR is, the difference between that. We've seen how and why XR will replace or will be the next mobile computing platform. And the next part, we saw a couple of examples. Now, what I'd like to do is just give you a glimpse into all the technologies that have to come and fall in place to make that happen. Phones, it's 2017 right now. In 2002, 
when I came to the United States, I had a Sanyo phone, which was the flip phone. And I was excited because that was the latest technology and I could do something which was very essential. Make calls from anywhere that I want. Today, the smartphone, sometimes we don't even use phones to make calls right now. We use it more for texting and WhatsApp and Facebook and it's a more of a communication connection interactivity device. And now, the way it has happened is over the past 14 years, technologies in camera, technologies, uh, technologies like camera, like display, the touch screen, apps ecosystem have all come together to provide the experience that you have today. Are you guys with me? 15 years ago, a device could only make a phone call. Today, the reason you can take pictures, selfies, is all because the camera technology has become really well. The display technology has become really well. The voice activation technology has become really well. Now, think of the example that I gave you, and if you see that for AR glasses and VR HMD, it's following a similar path. AR glasses, uh, the, it's also moving from the experiences that are coming from smartphones. VR is also coming from gaming consoles, laptops, and PCs. Now, in order for these technologies to fall in place, there are, at a very high level, from an experience perspective, there are these three pillars that needs to be taken care of. Immersive, cognitive, and connected. Immersive is to have a true immersive experience. The example that I gave you about, imagine wearing glasses and being in New York, uh, seeing the Hard Rock Cafe and the Disney Store and the Times Square building. Right now when I see all of you, when you guys see me, we, I have clear vision. There's something where I can, I'm seeing in 2020 vision, uh, I have this full field of view where, uh, where I'm looking at you right now, but I could still see the rest of the room. And it's clear. That sort of clarity in technology needs to be there. Today we're moving from 2K to 4K to 8K. The, the evolution of that clarity of display and graphics needs to happen. Cognitive. How many of you use an Android phone today? Right, so as you start walking, sometimes the Android phone says, uh, the traffic is 17 minutes slower than what it was today. How do you know? How do you know it's time for me to go home? The devices are becoming much more intelligent. Uh, most of you must have heard of something called as machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, these are some of the technologies that are helping make that happen and that needs to become stronger. Machine learning and AI is a completely different field, uh, but sometimes it's overused. It's like, uh, you know, it's like gluten-free. 80% of people want to use, eat gluten-free food, but they have no clue what it really means. So machine learning and AI is becoming something like that, but it, at a very uh, high level, devices are becoming much more intelligent, and that's the cognitive aspect. Connected, if I am wearing these glasses, let's say I'm visiting here, Binghamton right now, in October, uh, my wife's back in San Diego, and she's been asking me for the past three to four years, we should make a trip to New York to see fall colors. I'm here, she's not, if I could wear those glasses, and while walking in some of the areas here in our university, if I could just live stream, instead of having a phone and doing this, if I could just wear these glasses or a 360 camera and she could wear glasses and she could just look around, live stream it, you need tons and tons of data to be uploaded and downloaded over the air. So that sort of connectivity needs to happen. If you think about what's happened over the past 15 years, sending data, was sending text messages. That was 15 years ago. Now, sending data is sending streaming videos, Netflix, sending videos on messengers like WhatsApp, Facebook, and all this needs to be sent up the air. It's basically having bigger pipes to send data, and 5G is one of the future technologies that will help make that happen. So, let me give you an example. So, if I'm walking in, uh, Portugal, and if I'm just walking through the streets, I'm an American citizen, I'm walking through the streets and uh, I like my coffee, I like my cappuccino, I like my espresso, I want to know what the weather is in Fahrenheit, not in Celsius. As I'm walking this, first my glasses should be able to detect what's really out there. It should recognize, track, map, and reconstruct surroundings as I'm walking. As it walks, I, the device should actually say, okay, here's a cable, 
uh, here's a cable car, here's a cafe, here's a taxi, here's a passenger boarding, here's the 18th street, uh, the temperature right now is 98 Fahrenheit, as I'm walking, and not really disturbing my vision, but just giving me this data, and then somebody, my intelligent assistant telling me, hey, Kieran, hey, Tim, catch this trolley to take you to the next tour. This one also has air conditioning available. I need my air conditioning from San Diego. I'm sorry about that. So 5G enhanced mobile broadband is required to take VR, AR experiences to the next level. So there's the immersive experience, having the right kind of display technology, having the right kind of video technology, having the right kind of audio technology. George Lucas says 50% of any movie experience comes from the audio. So having all these technologies, imagine having this experience about New York and finding a cab going from this end of uh, this end to the other end. You'll first hear the cab from here, and then you'll hear the cab from here. That sort of experience in the audio world needs to happen. It needs to map those objects, different parts of the room, and give you that experience. That's when it will be a true immersive experience. So again, it was immersion, it was cognitive, intelligent, machine learning, AI, and of course, connectivity. I work at Qualcomm. Uh, we are accelerating the adoption of VR, AR. We have our own uh, chipset that we are building. We have our own SDK, and we have uh, devices like these that we work with the rest of the ecosystem, like Google Pixel for daydream devices, standalone devices in China, uh, folks like Lenovo, Asus, Motorola, and we are building uh, multiple devices with Google, uh, HTC Vive, and rest of the ecosystem that we'll be announcing soon in the next few weeks. VR and AR, as I said, will push connectivity requirements. We test based to that. I won't spend much time here. Uh, in summary, XR is the next mobile computing platform. XR is here today, but it's in its infancy, just like the devices for smartphones that we saw, there was this evolution over a period of 15, 20 years, and it will follow the same path. Advancements are required to make XR optimally immersive, cognitive, and connected. Qualcomm will continue working on this. Uh, this is something that we have. Last but not the least, this is a thought that I'd like to leave you all with. You cannot depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. Uh, as uh, there's this famous saying that you say, uh, we always say that you have to see it to believe it. But one thing that you see, the way technology breakthroughs have happened and the way the world is changing, you have to believe it to see it. So it starts from a belief. And the belief here is that definitely the technology landscape is changing. We at Binghamton here need to align in all ways possible, and I'm extremely proud of the stuff that folks like Matt are doing in these entrepreneurship abilities and capabilities coming out of this place, and some of the stuff that's coming out of Watson to align towards this. Thank you very much, and once again, I am extremely humbled, honored, and proud to be here, because this has been home, this is where it all began, and thank you very much for having me here, I appreciate it. So our next speaker, uh, Matthew Gell, where, where are you? Oh, there you are, right there. Oh, you took my seat. He's, he's playing uh, virtual reality tricks with me. Um, I'm very proud to, uh, to ask him to come up here in just a minute. He is a current student, a senior in electrical and computer engineering. He's a um, holder of a National Science Foundation STEM scholarship. He's in the 4 plus 1 program, which means we get to have you for another year as he finishes his master's program, so four years plus one additional year. He um, started a company, Enhance VR LLC, in your spare time. Uh, you are on the track team and cross country team. And I see Lorna Wells up here. Lorna um, uh, headed up the Watson uh, advising office for quite some time, and you're also a peer advisor in Watson. Okay, this is just typical of the students we get at Binghamton. So um, please welcome Matthew Gill uh, right from Watkins Glen to Binghamton and to our stage. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Hello, everybody. Again, like I said, my name is Matt Gill. I'm a senior here uh, in the Watson School studying electrical engineering, and I do a, a little bit of entrepreneurship on the side, and I'll get to that later. Um, 
So what I want to get into, I focus more on virtual reality. And as we heard a little bit as Hiran is talking, we've heard immersion and experience come up both at the same time. Now, to get to where Hiran is talking uh, about the future and what's happening with augmented reality and virtual reality and XR, uh, there's a lot of steps that have to happen, but there's a lot of steps that already have happened. And some of those actually happened right here in Binghamton, New York, and are continuing to happen. So breaking down the history, when I look back and seeing the roots of virtual reality and augmented reality and how that affects what it is today, it kind of breaks down to three categories. That is the age of immersion, the age of experiencing, and the age of exploration. So let me get into the first one. Virtual reality didn't start with a headset. Didn't start with a high-end computer system or a mainframe. In fact, it didn't even start with electricity. It started with paintings. And this happened around 900 CE to 1200 CE. And these paintings were panoramic paintings. It wasn't like your Mona Lisa or Picasso. These were designed to be completely, or surround the user completely in a room. So this one here is actually from China. And if the painting continue, it loops back around. But the idea as you see this is to make the onlooker feel like they're part of the experience that they're seeing, making it immersive, a more immersive painting. But really, panoramas didn't take off until the father of panoramas, which was Robert Baker. He was an Englishman of Irish descent. And he created a, an incredible detailed uh, panorama of London, which was, he was really known for. But he didn't just make paintings. You know, he worked with a, a team of people to create these uh, different types of panoramas. But he really coined what was the cyclorama. Now, the design behind this entire building that was meant for these paintings was that when someone would pay to go into it, they would travel through dark stairways and hallways and then come into a center stage where they're completely surrounded by the painting by natural sunlight. And the idea behind these dark stairways and hallways was that he wanted to take someone into a new world, a new light. He found in typical exhibits, when someone walked from painting to painting, the reality was broken of what they were witnessing. And so that was the design behind these buildings. Moving forward through time, we were, virtual reality and augmented reality was kind of stuck with stills. There was no life in it other than the paintings and photographs that were made. And it wasn't until Charles Wheatstone, uh, he created a, a new advancement in this type of uh, area. Of, um, it was three-dimensional uh, images. You know, he created depth into these pictures. And he did so by taking two pictures that were just slightly off enough and put into each eye would create a three-dimensional image in your brain. And today, some of you actually might remember these slide deck toys as a viewfinder. So I still remember using it myself. So now we're getting into the 1900s. Virtual reality has already gone through almost nine tenths of its existence to today, 2017. And it's again, it's only lasted in photos and paintings that have existed around the world, specifically panoramas. But we're going to see an explosion of new advancements and technologies from 1900s to today that at the same time is going to advance virtual reality as well. And during this period of time, virtual reality went from an immersion experience to just an experience, making it something completely new. And the technology helped that. So it kind of puts you into the time frame of 1900. There was only 45 states in the United States. And in 1901, one of the most advanced technologies that just got patented was a paperclip. So we've come a long way since then. But today, if you look around, and as here in discussing, we have smartphones in our pockets. And then we also have smart watches on our wrists that give us health reports and telling us the weather and what's going on, and even knowing our location and telling us the traffic that we're going to experience when we go home from work today. So it's come a long way uh, with technology. And virtual reality and augmented reality are also going to take these leaps and bounds as the technology keeps getting better. And speaking of these different technologies and where these advancements came from, like I mentioned earlier, some of these happened in Binghamton, New York. And, these hap and the first modern virtual reality experience started with a guy named Ed. Now, some of you locals, if you're around here, you might still remember who Ed was and the company that he created. But Ed was a local man. He was actually originally from Indiana, but he came at a young age uh, to live in Binghamton, New York with his family. Uh, and his parents ran the Link Organ and Piano Company. And the, at the years of its existence, it created something over 130 uh, theater organs and countless pianos. But in the background, while Ed Link was working on all these different types of systems, he was design, you know, creating this new passion for flying. And so he couldn't really afford to go flying all the time and afford to get the license right away. So he was commonly found over in Endicott or Cortland taxiing his friend's planes up and down the runway because he couldn't afford the fuel to go for a full flight. 
But eventually he did get his pilot's license and uh, continued to learn flying. But he didn't just stop with flying. It's an incredible experience on its own. But he wanted to take it one step further. And so at the age of 24, and after about a year and a half, he took the combination of his understanding of organ pneumatics and his engineering mind to create the first flight simulator. Now, this is the flight simulator. It's also known as the blue box. And the idea behind this is that there was no screen. Again, there is no display. There's no HMD you put on. All there were was all the accurate instruments you would have in an airplane, as well as the three degrees of movement, pitch, yaw, and roll. And him and his brother would sell and, uh, this experience out for a certain amount per hour to help train pilots to go flying. And you might be wondering, well, how can you go flying if you can't see where you're going? That was the exact idea behind this, is that a lot of times you had to land in the dark or bad weather, and you had to only rely on your instruments. It's flying by your seat of the plant, your pants. So, um, so what he ended up doing was talking to some Army officials, and he planned a setup to go meet them. And when he was flying to go uh, meet them, the runway had horrible weather, and the Army officials did not believe that he was actually going to land. He thought he was probably going to die. Um, but because of all the experience and time that he logged in his own plane to not have to know any visuals, but just experience flying on its own, he was able to successfully land the plane and after some negotiating, landed a contract with the United States Army and so from there created tens of thousands of systems that the United States used to train pilots, especially during World War II. And tens of thousands of pilots went through this program. As you can see, again, the pilots completely enclosed in it and they feel all the same motions and the instrument changes as they're moving along through their mission. While virtual reality has kind of existed a little bit in panoramic paintings, Link really created the first true modern virtual reality experience. Now, moving forward through time, we're getting to about the 1950s. This is when we're starting to have more displays, technology's getting better, and a man by Morton Healing created the Sensorama. It was an arcade-like machine. You put your coins in, you squeeze your face into the display, and he was a cinematographer, and he wanted more experiences in his films. And so what he did is he added a shaking seat, smells, sight, uh, winds that would blow on you. And you could even put your hands on things, and you feel tingling on your hands while you're in one of these. But again, this is it's showing the advancements of now kind of like a 4D movie theater that we know today. Even further moving along, um, the first HMD was created in 1961 by Philco Engineers. Now, this headset. Uh, um, what I mean by head-mounted display, let me back up a little bit, that's uh, HMD, head-mounted display. Uh, otherwise, it's usually just a monitor or something like that. But the Philco engineers, what they developed here wasn't so much of a VR, AR experience as it was more of just a fancy periscope. It was connected to a camera, and it would track the head movement and, and uh, mirrored that with the camera. So you might know this plenty on military vehicles today and using that kind of technology. But uh, a major factor here was Ivan Sutherland, who in 1968 created his own VR experience called the Sword of Domicles. And there was a reference to Greek mythology, but the, his system took up an entire room. And he had hanging pieces all overhead, and that was the, uh, why it was called what it was. Um, but it was the first real virtual reality and augmented reality experience. He was able to create basic shapes and, and colors and stuff like that that he could see and move around and actually see these images move around with him. Now, Ivan Sutherland didn't just provide an advancement in technology with virtual reality and augmented reality. He provided new beliefs, new concepts, and really truly set the standard of what virtual reality should be in the future. He wanted to create the ultimate machine by his definition for virtual reality. And to have an ultimate, the ultimate machine and what virtual reality could be, it had to be a virtual world viewed for an HMD and appeared realistic through augmented 3D sound and tactile feedback. The computer hardware had to create the virtual world and maintain it in real time. And that the, it gave the ability to users to interact with objects as if they were in the real world. And now he said, and I quote closely here, that the ultimate machine would, of course, be a computer system in a room that could control the room's matter. A chair in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining, and a bullet in such a room would be fatal. Now, I don't want to create any type of VR experience where I'm playing a game and I'm going to get shot and I'm actually going to feel that. But he really set the standard of what virtual reality can be, you know, all the way back in 1968. And today, we're you know, we know this from our video games and what you could actually create in a type of simulation. But back in 1968, this was pretty radical. But he really, again, set the standard of what virtual reality could and should be. So while Ed Link was kind of like the grandfather of virtual reality simulation, he kind of got it started. 
it was definitely Ivan Sutherland that really was the father. He made that next step, put the, put the word out there on what virtual reality should be. So moving forward, we're going to have more advancements in technology, and we're actually going to see more consumer ones. This was reality built for two. Uh, it was really the first kind of HMD headset that also allowed you to have tactile feedback, and it was designed to replace your phone for the price of $50,000 back then. So if you want to talk to someone and actually be able to see them, like Kieran was mentioning, you could do that back then, but it cost you quite a lot. But um, additionally, at the same time, uh, in the 80s, going into that period, uh, NASA was making amazing contributions to technology, as they always have. But specifically in virtual reality, they were making new headsets, tactile feedback, tracking, the different types of displays that are going to be used. They've, the amount of technology that they've created that has been used in VR in today's society is just immense. Um, but the interesting thing, though, is that they're still using virtual reality and augmented reality today, whether it be some type of robotic design or even having the Microsoft HoloLens augmented reality display up in space being used by astronauts. Um, uh, to also talk about the 80s, at the same time, so I've, we have all been saying virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, I've said a few times a new reality. It isn't until 1987 that the term virtual reality was actually coined. So from beyond this, it was only just a new reality. There, there was no virtual reality description yet. Now going into the 90s, this was kind of like the awkward freshman high school years of virtual reality. Everything was there, you're so confident, just wasn't ready yet. <laughs> and so this is actually uh, some of the first uh, consumer version headsets. This was the Sega uh, VR headset, Sega Gaming Company, you might know with like Sonic the Hedgehog. So, uh, this is one of the headsets. Nintendo actually came out with their own headset. It was called the Nintendo Virtual Boy. Uh, and there was also the iPhone, E-Y-E, -E, not iPhone. So, but it existed previously. Now, like I said, it was like kind of the awkward years for these headsets, and that reason was because the technology just wasn't there yet. The ideas and what these engineers and scientists wanted to create was there, but pairing that with a, a, a good quality experience that didn't make someone sick was very hard and, and to overcome. And in fact, the virtual boy, the reason it really failed, that doctors even said that it would cause extreme eye damage if you used it too long. So they all had these little problems with virtual reality. And, and, but the interesting thing in the 90s was that this was the first time that virtual reality was becoming uh, more consumer related. People were starting to get an idea that virtual reality, this exists, this is actually something. Um, now, while gaming companies were doing this, at the same time, the movie industry was making a, an impact on it as well. And, and some of my favorites, The Matrix movies in particular, at the end of the 90s. Now, if you guys remember this film, uh, what you see is not real. <laughs> take the blue pill, take the red pill, whatever one you, one you want. But this really took the average Joe that's sitting on his couch at home after he watched the film to really think about, am I, what, am I, what am I seeing? Is this actually real? Or am I just in another simulated world and that there's a whole other me that's just being used? So this really started to take more and more people and bring them into this virtual reality and augmented reality world and changing the mindsets of what people believe what VR could really be. This definition could really be Ivan Sutherland's true virtual reality machine. You could die in this machine by a bullet that truly could be fatal. So coming out of the 90s, we're in today, the 2000s. Oculus and HTC Vive are some of the well-known headsets that are out there. So Oculus was created, built, designed, tested, and resold to Facebook and released their CV1 version. HTC Vive creates their own virtual reality headset. As Kieran mentioned, you also have uh, Google Glass, the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, Google comes up with a low-cost version of a literally cardboard where you put your phone in to experience VR. And there's mixed reality and augmented reality. There's so many different things that are happening now in the 2000s. It's almost overwhelming. And again, that's why there's three of us talking about this, so we can each talk a little bit about something else. So there's plenty of time for that. Um, but again, but we have all these amazing tools, computer systems, visuals that can literally trick your eyes, your, your mind, and your body into believing what you're seeing is real. And so where does that leave us? We've gone through immersion, kind of introducing, putting yourself in a different landscape and making you feel like you're part of it, an experience with simulation and motion and making it feel like you're actually truly part of it. But what's next? And this is the age I like to call the age of exploration. We have all these fantastic tools that have gotten us to where we are. We can create the Matrix, the grid from Tron, or the holodeck from Star Trek. We can solve, we can create our own new worlds, but then we can also use this technology to create and solve problems in our own world. So we're looking beyond 2017 now. What, what can we do with this? And Kieran mentioned some of the things that are happening, and so will Mario. 
Um, and education, virtual reality specifically, is making an impact. Just like Kieran said, he will truly remember what he does, not just from reading or trying to do memorization or tests or writing. There's a company that actually recreated the Apollo 11 mission from start to finish with actual instruments, the actual recording, and so finally someone can experience this historical moment in, from mankind. Um, otherwise, they would only be reading from a textbook or seeing the video clips that someone else would have seen as they're watching it on TV. Um, another company is also creating an educational experience where they take uh, American history, that you would be in the Civil War time period and, and uh, trying to solve spy missions. That actually did happen. And so you had to have an understanding of the event and making sure in the virtual world, you're making that sure that the events happen in real time. Additionally, virtual reality and augmented reality are making major impacts in the medical field, specifically with anyone that suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, or you know, military veterans, are, you know, or anyone that, say, has lost a limb. Specifically with someone who is an amputee, they use virtual reality to train a, a new amputee on how to use their limb in everyday life before they actually give it to them. And then in reverse, they use someone who has lost a limb to train on a virtual limb so they can see the improvements that they can make to their virtual reality, or the, to their prosthetics, um, to improve them and, and keep reverse engineering and making a better product for said amputees. One that I think is very interesting, another use in uh, the medical field is for burn victims, specifically children that have su suffered severe burns. They're in constant pain. If you guys, anyone has ever worked in engineering, you've probably seen a video called Remember Charlie about a victim that, who talked about a year of suffering, suffering from burns, and the, the, the pain is relentless. And so whether it be from minor treatments or just sitting still, you can't escape this pain. And then for children, though, what a company has done is made a simulation where you saw pleasant views in a different world that when they put it on, they kind of got distracted. And now this child that is suffering endlessly is maybe not in so much pain anymore. And so it's, it's again, it's another interesting way that VR can make an impact and augmented reality in the medical field, not just analytics or data, um, truly helping people directly. Um, going into engineering, of course it's used in engineering. Augmented reality and virtual reality, whether it be showing a design for an engineering company in person, showing it to com customers for a new product that's going to come out, or even uh, contractors. Now, they can actually take their tablet, look up to a building, and then they can wipe away each individual layer from the HVAC system and the plumbing and the electrical to actually see what they're looking at and know where they have to make changes. Uh, one interesting I like, uh, thing that I found was uh, with Ford Motor Company, they actually create an augmented and virtual reality interior to their cars before they make them. And so they can put on the headset and experience the car in different situations to see what they like and what they don't like and get to interact with it before making the expense of making an entire model. They can actually do, which is kind of neat, is take their controller and turn it into a virtual flashlight. And they can make it nighttime and they can look around all the cracks and crevices and see how things reflect and if that's going to be a problem to the driver. So again, uh, going even further, uh, in the media, uh, about two years ago, I talked during the TED Talk here at Binghamton with one of my colleagues about the uh, interest of virtual reality in real world. And in the media, you can watch the New York Times, different articles and 360 videos, and actually experience being there, and now make it more of a meaningful impact. Instead of reading or listening to it on the radio, you get to see it firsthand. You can see virtual reality films at Sundance Film Festival or different indie films as well. It, it, the, you can keep going on and on and on with virtual reality and what it can be used for. But the one that most of you probably know as, and what we talked about at the TED Talk two years ago, was games. Everyone loves playing games. That's what it really was driven by. You saw the Sega, you saw the, uh, the Sega headset and the Nintendo Virtual Boy. Um, but it's happening more than that. Back, you know, you might remember, and they're still out there, internet cafes. There are now virtual reality and augmented reality cafes. In fact, thousands all over the world where people can pay to experience uh, virtual reality for you know, a low cost, but they can keep going back and experiencing such an incredible technology. So we have, again, all the parts and pieces uh, to finally make this kind of ultimate machine. We're still not quite there. We can't control matter just yet. But we can create visuals that really trick us. Now, that's where my company comes in. So in 2015, I started Enhance VR, who are now fantastic Binghamton alumni that I still stay in touch with. Um, and what we started with was virtual reality skiing. Uh, we saw the opportunity that if global warming is going to be making as an impact as it is, maybe we won't be able to go skiing in the future. What would we do if we didn't have skiing? Well, we'd maybe go to a facility that could do virtual skiing. And so we took some cell phones and some foam rollers and a Google Cardboard and we put it on and we would actually be able to do virtual skiing. Now, it was far from it and I'm a horrible skier, so I was horrible in this video game simulation as well. 
um, it, was, it was a whole new experience for me. While I was interested in virtual reality, I was only just a freshman, and getting into the Watson School was amazing enough for me. I like saying that I probably couldn't get into it now with the standards that we keep raising with all of our schools. Um, but to be able to create something like this and, and take the stuff that I learned in my classes and truly apply it and make rapid prototypes, I thought that was just the most exciting uh, time that I could do. And so I kind of kept going with that. And after one of the grad students left, it was me and this computer science student, and we said, okay, what, what more can we do? We love VR, we love AR. What's something that a college student could afford uh, and make a really interesting prototype that could have multiple uses? And so we created a, a two degree of freedom motion simulator. And this is our original one. We built it in 24 hours at HackBU, if you ever uh, hacked around here on campus. It's made out of everything, PVC parts, duct tape, two by fours, a little bit of my own blood when I cut myself on it. I mean, it was, it's got everything in it. And, and it functioned just enough. It's actually still in Old Dickinson in someone's probably alumni's dorm room. Um, it can't leave. We have to rip it apart and destroy it because it was built in that room. It has to stay in that room until we get rid of it. But, but it was a learning experience for us. We uh, wanted to create something more. We want, wanted to maybe go flying, driving. You know, what, what could we do? And this allowed us to do that. We could have pitch and roll motions paired with virtual reality. I felt like I was driving a Formula One car at Watkins Glen International. Now, while the motions all weren't there, you can imagine that can't create three G-forces out of it. That would be very impressive. Um, but it was a starting point. It was enough for us to say, hey, th this actually might be something. And we had other people that were getting in it before it broke. And we said, hey, this really could be something, too. It's maybe not a great idea yet, but you could keep working on it. And so that's what we did. And so we created our, our second beta model here that you see. It's a, another two degree of freedom simulator. It's kind of just a remake of the original, but it was stronger. We could put countless people in it without it falling apart on us. Um, but it, was, it gave us the ability to, again, have this diversity to it. I can interchange frames and components. If you want to go flying a plane like Ed Link could do back in the day, you can do that on this. But then again, you can also switch out a controller. You can fly in space and defend Earth and compete against people all the way around the world that are also playing the same simulation. And same thing with this one, like the original simulator. I could go racing an F1 car or you name it at any track in the world. I prefer Monaco. But it's a, it's a really great experience. And, and we're allowed, and giving people the opportunity to do that. Um, and I've been fortunate through some of my networking opportunities to be able to go around and see different simulation companies that exist and what's being made. The idea with our, what we're going for with our initial go-to product for our market here is creating something low cost to get more people in it. Like we said, virtual reality is incredible. It's still developing. It's in its infancy with augmented reality and, in, and having uh, glasses look exactly the same as you would the technology. So we want to keep uh, moving that forward as well with some of the things that we can create. So this, is not, this isn't a new headset. It's not the next AR glass that you're going to wear. But it's a new mouse and keyboard that you can use with virtual reality to make it more exciting, to keep more people in it. And that's what we want to do, from education to engineering. We're developing our team. We're expanding and we're growing. And what we really see is just creating these new peripherals and systems that can change old experiences and make new ones from it. And it's no coincidence that, <laughs> or it is a little bit of coincidence, serendipity, in fact, that we uh, started this in Binghamton, New York. Again, the, the birthplace of modern virtual reality with Ed Link. And we're very excited to be here. You know, I've, I had family ties all the way back to the Endicott Johnson Sioux Company. It's, it's really exciting to be in a place that I have some history tied to, but to see the opportunities that lie here with the students that we keep bringing into this university to keep improving these systems and making it better. So like I said, we have all these parts and tools. Uh, we have amazing headsets and computer systems that we're constantly improving, and we're trying to make our own systems ourselves. So really, we kind of want to make Ivan's ultimate machine. We want to take all these parts and pieces to really make a chair that you could sit in, maybe not handcuffs that are confining or a bullet that could kill you, but we want to make something that you'll never forget. And so really, we want to change just playing to being immersed, going from just using to an experience and change learning to exploration. Thank you. So, um, and Matthew, is it true that you're not a good skier? I'm more ice snowboard. Okay, it's nice to know he's not good at something. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, also impressive is our next speaker. So uh, inhaling from Vestal, New York, so real roots here. Welcome back home. 
Uh, in the physics department here is uh, Mario Palumbo, Dr. Mario Palumbo, who is our next speaker, and uh, has had a very impressive career since uh, leaving Binghamton University. Prior to joining Intel, he was uh, Vice President of Engineering at Recon Instruments, which is uh, a leader in smart eyewear products. I got a chance to look at a, a product that cyclists could wear that could give them all sorts of heads-up information, which uh, he and I are both cyclists, so I was excited to hear about that. He was Chief Technology Officer at Lighthouse VCI. It was a real-time intelligent video processing company. And he was also Vice President of Engineering at Spectrum Signal Processing, which was specializing in high-density voice over IP protocols. He's Director of Technology for Wearable Devices at Intel's New Devices Group. So please welcome Mario. All right. OK, I promise I'm going to make this talk about you guys. It won't be about me. It won't be about technology. I want to turn this around and get this about why, why would any of you be interested in AR? Why should you be in AR? Are you ever going to actually own these products, use these products? Are they going to affect your daily life? So that's going to be sort of the question we're going to try to answer. And I want to just take you through a line of reasoning that will help you understand what is happening today. And uh, the two uh, previous speakers did a good job in laying some of that groundwork. And then how this will evolve into uh, something you could use in your daily life. The first thing I'm going to show here is a uh, video clip. And it's kind of a, I would call it an aspirational video clip. It only lasts 15 seconds. It's just to give you a sense of what we mean by digital um, or virtual objects interacting in the real world in a very convincing and realistic way. Um, and that's sort of the, the key to AR is that we've got We've got this real world, and we're trying to place digital objects, but it has to be convincing. It has to be, you may remember the, the Roger Rabbit movie, right? They had the animated characters and the real characters. Well, this is like doing that all the time. It's like real life, um, real life Roger Rabbit. So let's just watch this, and um, then we'll talk about what, what, was, um, what was going on. So what is it about this? little video that makes it so I got a whoa. That was great. I kind of wanted a whoa. Because um, it's, it's kind of a striking video when you see it. And, and the reason it's so convincing, though, I'm actually going to show it one more time, is that the, the whale is inter, interacting with the floor, right? The people's heads here are actually occluding some of the splash. It looks like it's real in the environment. And this stuff is actually, you see shadow on the hands and so on. It looks like these objects are actually real and there, um, right down to the last detail. And this is a difficult thing to do. And it's the reason why some of the products that you've seen are not actually that compact and that wearable. So what are the products that can do this today? So there actually are products that can do this today. That video was made by a company called Magic Leap. I have them in the corner. Um, they actually haven't released a product yet. Uh, we're all waiting very anxiously to see what they come out with. But these companies have, right? And these are what the headsets look like. Um, now, I don't know if looking at this, you think, gosh, I really wish I had one of these. I mean, some of you may be, but as the previous speaker spoke about, um, the most typical uses for these now are games, other forms of entertainment. And there are some enterprise office-based uses for 3D design architecture, this kind of thing. But they're, they're really not mainstream products. They're quite far from it. I mean, if you. And you can't imagine how something like this really would be a mainstream product, something you'd use on a daily basis. Um, I want to say just a little more about the Microsoft product, because I really think it's the best one in the world right now. And it's not the best because it has the best display. In fact, it doesn't. It's the best because it's the best at making things interact with the real world. Right? If you look at the very top of the product here, there's an amazing array of sensors that allow it to detect the real world and map it, which allows it to put things in the real world. Like these are actually holograms, real life holograms they're generating that they can, you can anchor. Um, these screens are holographic here. But if she was to get up and walk around, this globe would stay on the table. She could look at it from different angles. It's like anchored. It's like a real thing. Um, and that's because the device knows where the table is. 
It understands the table, the room, it understands all those dynamics, and it's able to put that there. And it also understands perspective. So if she was to go around it, you know, she would see Asia instead of seeing um, uh, the Atlantic Ocean or Africa there. So, so is this, I mean, are these kinds of products the things that should get you excited about AR? Are these the things that should get you thinking, I'm going to get involved with AR myself? And I would say it's, they're not, right? What, what we are trying to do, and I think the main, um, the, the main way to get these products into the mainstream, and, and by the way, I, I meant to say I have one of these products here, by the way. If anybody wants to check it out afterwards, I've got, uh, I've got a Microsoft HoloLens with me, and um, we can turn it on even, and you can, you can check it out if you like, um, just to get a sense of some of these experiences. But the, the key is, how do we start bringing some of these experiences, and I'm phrasing that carefully, start to bring some to regular glasses, everyday glasses, glasses you would wear every day, right? Like these, for example. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, I like the steampunk glasses, but no, I don't mean those. I mean glasses like these. And we have to use Johnny because he wears glasses like nobody else. Um, and what I want to talk about is how we bring real life, um, practical user experiences to glasses like these. Now, they might not be as immersive. There won't be whales jumping out of the street. But I'm not sure you really need that in your daily life. Um, so what I'm going to do is run through a few uh, examples. There's actually tons of examples, but I'll run through a few very practical examples of the kinds of stuff that we could bring to these kinds of glasses. And, and we could do, uh, if not exactly right now, very soon, very soon. So first example is navigation. This was already brought up. Um, Hiran brought it up. Uh, navigation is probably the most commonly used thing on your smartphone that isn't communication based, right? Like we text and we, we email and we call. But when you really go look at apps, Google Maps and navigation is probably the number one thing. How do I get around um, when I'm driving, when I'm walking? And with these types of glasses, you could actually have a, you know, a clear lens. You're just seeing the world. And when an instruction needs to come up, turn left, turn right, um, those displays could, be, could come up in your field of view and be overlaid on reality um, to help you do this kind of na navigation in a very natural way. Um, Another example would be translation. Uh, this is a niche example. It's very travel-based. But if you're in a foreign country, imagine you could just look at a sign and you could just read it. It'll, just, uh, it'll change the, the text to a, a language you understand. Um, it would be quite amazing. Um, I like the, the theme music here. This is fantastic. Well done. <laughs> Can we get a few hallelujahs, please? Um, and another one, it would be point of interest in reviews, for example. Now, and there's lots more. Actually, I was just reading an article about uh, virtual art. So there's these, these people doing, use your cell phone for it today, because it's really the only medium for this. But they create digital art in the, in, the, uh, in the world that will be sitting somewhere, like let's say the quad in this building. And if you walked out there and it held your phone up so that the camera could see the quad, it would re realize where it was and render like a statue or a sculpture or something in that, in that space. Um, there's loads of examples like this. And there'll be a lot more that people think up that I'll never think up once these products get out in the world. Um, and I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, I can just do this on my phone, right? Like this example even shows it on the phone. Like all this stuff exists on the phone. And it does. If you're happy to take your phone out and point it at the world, right, occupy your hands and Occupy your attention in this way. You can do all of this stuff, right? There, you don't need to have glasses. But if you've ever used these kinds of products, uh, which I have, you realize that when this becomes just, it almost seems like an innate power that you've just taken on by putting these on. You have a lens. You're the only person who sees it. Your hands are free. You're not, you're not doing this, you know? You're just able to do this stuff, right? Um, that's why I use the term superpowers at the beginning, because it's, Kind of like you've just developed this innate ability to do something. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about here is digital assistants. Um, if you've ever used Siri, Google Assistant, or the Amazon Alexa on their Echo product, these things are really coming to the fore now. People are loving this stuff. And a lot of people do simple things with them now. You know, What's the weather in Bangladesh or something? But you know, you, so you can prompt these things to do things for you. Call my mother for me or whatever. But, 
the future of these is to become, as Hiram was mentioning, much more cognitive, much more aware of you, who you are, what you do in your life, what your habits are, and giving you contextually relevant information, suggestions, uh, assistance. Um, and so the glass has become, whoops, dang it, I, I, I've just stolen my own thunder. So the glass, the, the glass has become not only a medium for you to see things, right? But um, they also become uh, an input device to help inform these things of wh what's going on in your world. So your, your glasses are always looking at what you're looking at, right? They're always hearing what you're hearing because these glasses will have sensors in them. So therefore, the digital assistants now, they know everything about you and where you are and what you're doing, and they, they have that context now to give you better, better input. You've already seen Iron Man, so Jarvis was Iron Man's Siri if you've ever seen these movies. Um, he basically had his own digital assistant. And um, closing a loop here on the superpowers, this is the kind of thing that this will evolve to, where, where these uh, automatic digital assistants will be personalized to you and will give you what you need to know in the context that you're in. OK, I just want to talk about two products. I know you guys have been in here for a long time. Two products and why we don't have these today. Why, don't, why aren't we all wearing smart glasses today? Because I'm, I'm sure you've, you're all very motivated now to have these powers, so why don't we have them? So this is a little bit of a plug. As um, James mentioned, I was uh, the head of engineering for this company, Recon, before Intel acquired us about two and a half years ago. And the main product we made um, while I was there was this smart glass. It was called Recon Jet. I've got one here. I've got the black version. And this was a, uh, a cycling glass. So if anyone here is a serious cyclist, you know that um, there's these things called cycling computers you can mount on your handlebars. And they basically track your ride. They'll tell you the speed you're going, you know, the incline of the hill you're on, all this kind of dashboard stuff. And we offered it in a little display that was right there before, below your eye. And these are some of the screenshots. You know, you, your real-time dashboard, what's happening on your ride right now. And there were a lot more things we could put on there. Um, power, grade of hill, et cetera. Navigation and the ability to see incoming notifications if you wanted to stop and deal with them or keep going. But you were always in the know. And uh, this product was released in 2015, um, just a couple of months before we were bought, coincidentally. Um, and we also made, or I should say with Oakley, we made a ski goggle. And that actually predated it. This is back to maybe 2012. We made the electronics that went into Oakley's Airwave ski goggle, which I believe is still available for sale from Oakley. Um, and similar things. While you're out skiing, you can get all of this information about your skis, your, your speed, your jumps, your inclines, how many uh, vertical feet you've done. But this is not a lifestyle product. These products are for activity. Put it on, do your activity, take it off. What about a lifestyle product? I put it on, I keep it on. It's, it's my glasses. It's my daily glasses. There's really been only one serious attempt at this, and that was by Google. I've got one of these as well, one of these beautiful white glasses. And this is not a bad-looking product. Um, it's small. It's lightweight. It's a lensless glass. It's a little bit weird. But, um, but, they, but it is still an extremely conspicuous product. If one of you had walked into the room today wearing this, you could expect a lot of very strange looks, double takes, what's going on over there. It's, it's a product that still, we're not accustomed to seeing this kind of thing on people's faces. Um, these very conspicuous uh, uh, module, it's asymmetric and just not pleasing to the eye. Um, but still, a lot of people decided they wanted to wear these. And in Silicon Valley especially, which is the, you know, the nerve center of this kind of um, technology adoption, people started wearing them, quite a lot actually. They were really getting into it. And a very interesting thing happened. Um, First thing that happened, they were, well, they were banned. Um, and you know, you may remember from the very early days of the cell phone, when one to two people out of 10 had cell phones, they were banned in places too. People didn't want you talking on your phone in a coffee shop or in a restaurant. It annoyed everyone. You know, who does this guy think he is? He's got to be on his phone. You know, what's not going to happen if he doesn't just put that away, you know? <laughs> and now, of course, we, we don't care. We all have them. Nine out of 10 people have phones, you know. It doesn't matter to us that uh, people talk on their phones in a coffee shop or something. It's just normal. Well, this 
this was banned because it was just new and it was different. And there was another issue, which is that little hole there is a camera. And there was this, um, I think, somewhat irrational paranoia that you know people are filming me all the time when I don't want to. There was this voyeuristic end of, end of this. Um, and then they came up with a new term for people who insist on wearing these. Anyway, I am not making this up. That, that's, they, they, look at that, I love it. They, you could even tell a nerd wrote this, uh, this definition, right? Um, <laughs> but so this is what we refer to in the business as social cost, right? What it, what it costs you socially to wear and use these products. Um, most of us buy products for social credit, right? We want to go out, we buy our shoes, our clothes, we look in the mirror, we want to look good. We want people to think we look good in our clothes. We want some credit for it, you know? Um, this was a debit. This was, you look foolish in this thing, and by the way, you're actually violating my privacy. Um, you know, take it off. So this is a real barrier for this industry. Uh, maybe the biggest barrier, it's actually bigger, I think, than the technological barriers now. We can do a lot of the stuff we need to do to create AR glasses. Um, but we can't do it yet. As, uh, as Hiran had mentioned, Mark Zuckerberg said, we can't make the product we want to make, which is the product that Johnny was wearing, right? Which is the product that will do this without creating these antibodies to come out of society. OK, so in summary, where do we go from here? Well, this has been mentioned. All of these um, screenshots here are from Conferences held this year by four of the biggest tech companies on the planet, right? Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook. And they committed a significant amount of time in those discussions to AR. AR has become the, maybe along with artificial intelligence, um, the, one of the main uh, investment areas in Silicon Valley now for the big primes, and even for startups and all manner of company, like, like Matt's company, for example. Um, and I am convinced I'm, that this will come, that we will, um, we will have products, probably you'll start to see them in the next maybe two to three years, coming from some of these companies that are symmetric glasses, they look normal, they have a lens. This lens will have a magical capability to display objects in your field of view. Um, it may not be quite as immersive as the video clips I showed or some of the other stuff you've seen, it's going to have to start and go forward. But there's two ways to attack the market. One is, like HoloLens has done, create everything, create all the experiences, boil the ocean, um, and then see if you can make it smaller. And then the other way is to say, well, why don't we just take a simple set of features and a beautiful pair of glasses and see how we can move that up. Um, and that thread is about to start, um, I believe, very strongly. And if I'm invited back here for my 40th anniversary, then you're probably all going to be wearing them. But anyway, thanks for your time. So what questions do you have? Anybody have a question? I have lots. Yes. Uh, OK, can you hear me? OK, so what? You guys are making these wonderful devices, but and this might be more forward thinking 10, 15 years on in the future. How do your companies? plan on dealing with the potential security issues with devices like this. Uh, it, it creates uh, more porous security barriers for companies, militaries. Um, famously recently, uh, for example, one of the governments in the Middle East, they started tracking uh, the dating applications of LGBTQ youth, and everyone was urged to get off of that now. You make wonderful products, but people can abuse them. And up till very recently, it was always push the responsibility onto the consumers. What do your companies plan on doing in order to harden their systems to make it difficult to break in, make it difficult to abuse? Yes, people will still figure out a way around it, but it should not be easy. And with the way the current uh, technology landscape it is, it's very easy, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay, good, good question. Feel free to, to jump in. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. So one of the things about, um, I think from a network security perspective, the glasses aren't much different than the phone. And in fact, they're going to be based on a lot of very similar 
technologies for connectivity and so on. So to the extent that phones are insecure, the glasses will be insecure, all of these mobile device problems uh, need to get fixed. But to the extent that phones are secure, glasses are secure. But there is another aspect to it, which is in, in some ways they're more private because the information exists between your eye and something that's a half an inch in front of your eye, which means that when you're, you know, when you're doing this on your phone, it becomes very easy for people to see what you're doing. And the other thing about these devices is when they come into being, like right now on your phone, you use your thumbprint or a passcode to authenticate, we're probably going to have biometric authentications, which means if the wrong person puts it on, the thing just won't work. So if you pick up my glasses and put them on and you try to get them to go, they're going to recognize that's not Mario. And if you're not an authenticated user, um, whether that's done through iris prints or through voice prints or other mechanisms to identify me, then um, you know, it'll be actually harder for people to use them, or just as hard as, as it is with, um, with, say, cell phones now and the biometric authentication on those. No, that, that, that's a good point. Did either of you want to add I something to that? Yeah, um, I think security in general is, is, is a huge, diverse topic, right? I mean, security is, I think one of the things that Mari just mentioned was ensuring that I am using my device and you're not using my device. So security aspects of that. Security aspect of if I'm wearing my device and if I'm walking around the room, I should not be able to tag any single person out there. So if you, if you just look at, and I'm going to, just geek out a little bit here, but uh, the, the device, it starts right from the hardware and you have software on it and there's another, a couple of layers of software and then there's the application. Is the responsibility of every single layer of where we're working through the stack, we're building this whole cake, if you may, to provide the right security features. So from the hardware side, yes, we're taking uh, certain steps. Uh, people who are working on the middleware framework as well as people who are developing applications and ecosystems just like Google and Facebook, uh, these guys are taking their right steps as well. And at the end of the day, I love something how, what, uh, how Steve Jobs used to put it. He used to say, we believe in our end consumers. They're all intelligent people. We are building all the security mechanisms, but it does come down to the end consumer as well. Are we taking the right steps? Absolutely. We could discuss more about it offline, but there's a lot of security aspects that have to be taken here. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I, we'll, we'll take a couple more and then we're going to play with some of these devices. <laughs> yes, over here. Let me run over. Oh, I love being filled down here. It's great. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it, it's very interesting, but um, I, I know this has been uh, disavowed by a lot of phone companies, but I've seen, uh, I've read a lot of information and seen documentaries about the EMRs, uh, electromagnetic radiation, and when you have something like the uh, phone watches or the glasses right on the face kind of beaming in, I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment about the actual physical danger that might ensue. Sure, yeah, great question. So what are the health risks of this? Um, I think like any other technology, extreme overusage of any other technology has its own impact. Be it cell phone, be it television, whether it's impacting your eyes or brains or anything else. However, when these technologies are in the process of being developed, a lot of these factors are taken extremely seriously. When I was, uh, before I joined my company, I used to get these forwards where to get forwards in emails back then where I said, don't keep the phone to your ear for a long time or you're going to have these brain waves. And when I went, when I joined a company like Qualcomm that specializes in you know, building these antennas and waves, I spoke to a few people and said, how much truth is there to it? And then I realized that these things are taken extremely seriously by every single component maker, be it the chipset vendor, be it the device maker. And there are policies that are set place within the countries across the world including folks like, you know, companies like AT&T and Verizon, who are these carriers, who put these systems in place. Now, that's as far as smartphones concerned. As far as AR, VR is concerned, uh, as I was talking to a few folks yesterday, that you, now you're wearing uh, the smartphones, like when you have smartphones you're keeping in your pocket, the phone does become hot sometimes. Now, imagine having glasses, doing all this computation and data right here, and having that fright of, what if the glasses blow up? What if something happens to my eyes? What, what if, this, if I have this heat? So that's something that we take extremely, extremely seriously. You want to set the devices at a certain temperature. If there's a lot of uh, things that happen beyond that, it has to 
the, the device temperature needs to go down. All these factors are taken extremely seriously. Everything that the three of us have spoken about is, of course, you know, the experience and the end user experience. It's like me telling you, use a smartphone and you'd be able to connect to people around the world. You'd be able to communicate. You'd be able to send text messages. However, when we go back and roll up our sleeves and start working on this, the first thing that we think about is the safety of the end consumer. And that's something that's taken very seriously, be it irrespective of the companies that we're working for. Yeah, good. Did you want to add something, uh, Mario? Absolutely, Matt, say a few words. Or uh, you don't, uh, what I would say is that for the lifestyle glasses, the ones we did, we actually used the Bluetooth link, which is the same thing you use in uh, the Apple iPods, AirPods that people have, or the little Bluetooth headset you see people wearing around, which are, is much, much safer. Um, we've not put a cellular modem on, on glasses, and it's not clear we need to. Um, the the um, regulations from the FDA for limbs and your head and your torso are different on the amount of radiation they can take. And Apple has just come out with a new version of their watch, which will have a cell modem. So you could imagine a system, which is this is the uplink, the glasses just talk to that using a much weaker wireless link. It's much shorter range. It's only got to go three feet. So the power is a lot lower. And um, as, as long as the FDA and the FCC requirements are right, because all these products have to be tested, and those tests are public. You can go online and look at a teardown of uh, both of these products and how all the antennas, all the power levels, all that stuff is made public through the... Uh, I can't remember if that was the FDA or the FCC. I think it's the FCC that publicizes all that. Okay, thank you very much. We've got time for probably two more questions. You had a question? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming and speaking with Tear Talks. We really appreciate you bringing your expertise uh, here into Binghamton and seeing where, where your journeys began and where it's taken you. So thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to chat a little bit. Uh, one of the themes I saw with um, Google and Apple and Facebook, everyone says we don't have 5G, we don't have the resources to make these, you know, really uh, come to life. Uh, so how do you continue to innovate and experiment knowing that you don't have all the resources that you need? Um, could you expand a little more when you say that we don't have resources? Uh, in the sense that the, the technology of 5G and being able to, having the data pipelines to really communicate uh, you know, 360-degree video to San Diego. Yes. Uh, so you don't have kind of that tube to get to the final answer and know yeah. is what I'm doing right now going yes. to work. So, so how do you continue to, to operate in that? Well, you know, like any other technology, it's the ecosystem has to come together. And uh, we, uh, I mean, I can speak for Qualcomm here, because Qualcomm's at the uh, forefront of driving 5G right now, is we do expect 5G devices and the network to start around 2019, 2020. So there's a 5G summit in Hong Kong two weeks from now. So you'll see a lot more news articles and publications that will come out of that. But um, in, in, it is like, as if you think of all the building blocks, like if you just think of a smartphone that works today, uh, there's a smartphone that's, let's say, made by HTC. It has the processor of uh, Qualcomm. It has the operating system by Google, and then the wireless network that's supported by AT&T or Verizon, and having the right net network infrastructure. Similarly, for 5G, each of these building blocks are trying to figure out, OK, the kind of experiences needed for 5G. The 360 video streaming is a perfect example. Having the AR, VR glasses. Uh, folks like, as you saw, Tim Hodges, uh, Tim Hodges the Deutsche Telekom CEO, trying to make sure that having the right net, network infrastructure to fall in place. And then, of course, folks like Qualcomm uh, and other peers in the industry trying to push this technology boundaries further to help develop the right modem or the right wireless link at the right power and thermal constraints while making sure that 5G gets established. So it is falling in place, uh, and everybody is playing their own role in trying to make that happen over the next three to four years. So a little bit of chicken and egg, right? So uh, which, which comes first and, and the network needs to be developed. All these pieces need to come together. I want to play with these devices. So we're going to take one more question and then we're going to play. <laughs> Mine is more of a theoretical question because it would require a lot of advancement in the medical field. Is it seems looking at what you're doing, 
the logical progression would be to do away with the glasses altogether and have something in the neighborhood of a biomechanical implant for your eyes so that it would include a camera and there's a science fiction shows on TV that have represented this, yes. particularly by maybe not the military, but by like police organizations. So they don't need anything else. They can have all this heads up information and they know what's going on. And that would be a, a have to have a huge leap but nobody has commented on that. It's, it's actually not as far as you may think. I mean, there's even, um, it, it was actually a, a, a joke film kind of where a Canadian film director lost his eye and he made a camera eye and had it all hooked up and he made a film of his friends from his actual eye. Um, in terms of getting the technology down to that small, it is, as Hiran has said, it's going to take leaps and bounds between different industries to be able to put those kind of things together. But I mean, for what things have been showing and the, the trends and what he was showing with, even with the cell phone, um, it's definitely possible in the near future. There's companies that have shown it being able to be possible. I know one company I've seen do a little bit with some AR work where instead of actually having, you have a screen and then you're looking at the screen, you have some lenses and then it hits your eye and you're seeing it focus just like your glasses and some kind of display. Instead the display um, doesn't try to focus uh, where, uh, through any lenses, it's pre-calculated so that it actually goes right to your retina. So it creates a different type of display that you would see. Um, may improve pixelation that you'd see if you stood at your TV really close or something like that. But again, these technologies are, are starting to pop up here and there, but it, it is, it's, a, it's, it's something that could happen in the near future. So uh, I, I know we all have uh, a busy day planned. Uh, one more time, please thank our three guests. Thank you. Thank you.